room is empty, keep volume a shade high, and the picture will be in starting position. On our foresight, besides our own. History will bear out how we fulfilled our obligations to the future. Not an easy task in a world strained by many things, including a population boom. Nowhere in the United States has this boom presented a greater problem than in Southern California, where a complex civil has superimposed itself on a near desert. The population of this arid land has doubled since 1950 now shows signs of tripling. To sustain these people, and millions yet to come, takes fresh, pure water in staggering volume. Where will it come from? This is our story. The story of the greatest aqueduct project in the history of mankind. A project with one end in mind. To get water south. This is California as it might appear from space, a contradictory land seemingly created to challenge man's ingenuity. Seventy percent of its water originates in the northern third of the state, much of it wasting through the Golden Gate into the Pacific. 77% of its water needs are in its southern two-thirds, mostly on the coastal plain of Southern California. Half the state's population lives there, within the boundaries of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. From its Los Angeles headquarters, this cooperative organization of cities and water agencies directs one of the world's largest water systems. Its Colorado River aqueduct supplies more than a hundred cities and many large unincorporated areas. For a quarter of a century, it has provided Southern California with the water to grow on. One billion gallons a day. Yet even this mighty project cannot much longer satisfy the water needs of the growing Southland. Meeting these demands will be the California Aqueduct, now being built by the state of California through its Department of Water Resources. It will bring surplus Northern California water 450 miles to Southern California. On November 8, 1960, California's voters authorized the sale of $1,750,000,000 in bonds to finance the Mammoth Project. In Los Angeles, four days earlier, the Metropolitan Water District had signed the first contract with the state for a supply of water to be delivered by the future aqueduct. It was the prototype for some 30 contracts signed later by other water agencies in Northern, Central, and Southern California. The Metropolitan Water District has contracted for the largest amount of water almost half the project's total output. This water must also be transported the longest distance. For these two reasons, Metropolitan bears almost 70% of the aqueduct's total cost. This is where it really starts, in the high country of Northern California. The winter snowpack will warm under the spring sun and bring thousands of mountain streams to life for their long, twisting journey to the sea. For they will join and rejoin, form unnamed waterfalls and brooks, tributaries to remote creeks with names like Last Chance and Little Last Chance, Indian, Red Clover, Big Grizzly, until they create the Feather River. 
controlling it will take the highest dam in the United States. Its location, a few miles above the city of Oroville. A derelict marooned nearby tells part of the story. A story that began before the turn of the century, when there were more gold dredges here than anywhere else in the world. Behind them, they left immense fields of banked rocks and gravel, tailings of a hydraulic process which turned earth to mush, spewed out soil, separated gold, and piled the leftover rocks in graceful patterns. These worthless rocks are now a basic material in building Oroville Dam, along with adobe clay native to the area. Moving both rocks and clay has brought about some unique developments. One of the biggest diggers ever built. Day and night, it prowls back and forth, devouring banks of rocks. They drop onto a conveyor belt and travel to hoppers for loading into gondola cars. Four trains of 40 cars each, carrying rocks or clay, make continuous round trips to the dam site 11 miles away. Then it's across the river by conveyor belt to be loaded in earth movers. They take the final big step to the dam. Dump their cargo and leave it to be compacted into the body of this 70-story man-made mountain. Approximately one load of clay is used for 50 loads of rocks. The clay helps form the dam's watertight core. When the dam is finished, its crest will rise to here. Its base on this downstream side will extend beyond the highway bridge seen here during the last few seconds of its life. Farther upstream above the dam, this new highway bridge is an example of the many major companion benefits of the California aqueduct. Not only local bridges and roads, but also major highways and railroads are relocated and modernized by the state. One of the diversion tunnels of the partially completed Oroville Dam in December 1964. It releases storm water held back by that dam to prevent scenes like this one. When the dam is completed, these tunnels will be closed and the stored water released through gigantic turbines to generate electricity. Even in this early stage of construction, however, the dam prevented loss of lives and millions of dollars in damage. This cavern is at the downstream base of the Oroville Dam. It leads inside the mountain to a huge underground chamber. It will house the Oroville power plant six giant units generating electricity. Three are reversible, so they can also be operated as pumps. During hours of peak electrical demand, water can be released from Oroville Reservoir to pour through turbines and generate electricity. During the hours of least electrical demand, three of the units can be reversed and used to pump water back up into the reservoir. 
it will be stored until another period of peak electrical demand, when it can be released again through the generators. By juggling the water and electricity throughout its operation, the project will recover a large part of its pumping expense. This dam, under construction downstream from Oroville, will impound Feather River water in another reservoir and divert it into another reversible power plant. Then it will discharge back into the Feather to continue downstream and finally flow into the Sacramento River. Scientists and engineers keep track of every phase of the aqueduct project. They conduct tests of all materials involved in construction. Both state and federal laboratories experiment with various concrete mixes and steel alloys to determine which will provide the type of material and degree of strength necessary for different structures. Many interesting discoveries have been made during the course of the aqueduct's exploration and excavation. State archaeologists examine and catalog representative samples of prehistoric Indian and early California artifacts. the headquarters of the State Resources Agency in Sacramento, where plans are drawn by the Department of Resources for the California Aqueduct. It will house an electronic control center from which the water flowing the entire 450 mile length of the aqueduct can be regulated. Precise water control is vital in operating an aqueduct. Scale working models test the performance of various canal, gate, spillway, and control structure designs. Confetti marks the particular current this control structure creates. Gates play an essential role in the California aqueduct, particularly near the town of Hood on the Sacramento River, downstream from the capital. Present plans indicate that intake gates will be built near here to divert a portion of the flow into an unlined canal which will circle the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Once a gigantic marsh, the delta was reclaimed by dikes and drainage to become an important agricultural and recreational region. More than 1,000 miles of waterways meander around islands, under bridges, and between ferry landings as the water moves on into San Francisco Bay and through the Golden Gate. On the San Joaquin, near part of our mothball fleet, four pipes the size of railroad tunnels will curve under the river to carry the canal's flow. It will end in a reservoir near the town of Tracy. From there, a branch will lead to the Delta Mendota Canal which was built and is operated by the Federal Bureau of Reclamation as part of its Central Valley project. It supplies irrigation water to the northwest San Joaquin Valley. Here on the Delta's southern edge is the start of the California aqueduct itself. More than three and a half billion gallons of water will be lifted 24 stories each day at the Delta pumping plant. The South Bay aqueduct branches off toward San Jose to serve areas in Alameda and Santa Clara counties. From the northern part of the delta, an aqueduct will serve Solano and Napa counties. Water in the main aqueduct continues south another 62 miles through a concrete canal big enough for a seagoing freighter. It leads into the San Luis division of the project. Key undertaking here is San Luis Dam. Three miles long, it is being built across the mouth of a great shallow valley at the foot of the Diablo Mountains. It will create a reservoir unlike any other its size, for San Luis will be supplied entirely by a man-made river, the California Aqueduct. Like Oroville, it will have a power plant with reversible units. The cost of both the dam and the canal extending south more than 100 miles is shared with the Federal Bureau of Reclamation, with the Bureau in charge of design and construction. This unprecedented joint venture was agreed upon because the Reclamation Bureau can use the San Luis Reservoir and this reach of the aqueduct
to supply irrigation water to the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Along the way, 18 miles south of San Luis, the Dos Amigos plant will lift the water again. A canal, like a house, must be built on solid ground. These rectangular ponds make that possible. In some areas along the canal route, there are loose, unstable soils which settle 10 feet or more when water in great quantities is brought into contact with them. These sections have been scooped out, diked, and kept flooded. Frequent measurements indicate the rate of settling, and more important, when it definitely stops. The section is dried out and excavated. Specially built machines down the unfinished canal, trimming it to perfect size and completing it. At Kettleman City, where the Bureau of Reclamation's San Luis Division ends, the state again takes over aqueduct construction. From here, the coastal aqueduct will one day branch off to serve San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. The main canal will travel through the oil-rich Kettleman Hills toward the southern rim of the Great Central Valley, the Tehachapi Mountains. On its journey south, the California aqueduct will deliver a third of its flow to vast farm areas in Kings and Kern counties. Pumps will raise the water 95 stories at three separate plants. But still ahead is the biggest water lift of all time. The site of the Tehachapi pumping system, which will lift more than two billion gallons of water a day, a third of a mile a job requiring pumps are the most powerful ever built. The Tehachapis from the air. The scar in the landscape is the San Andreas Fault, a deep living rift in the Earth's crust. It emerges from the Pacific at Point Arena and slashes down across the state. The San Francisco earthquake of 1906 was the last time this fault shook in a big way in the north. In the south, not since the Fort Tejon quake of 1857. But geologists know someday the San Andreas must move again. And any aqueduct to Southern California must cross it. This narrow exploratory tunnel is being drilled into the midriff of the Tehachapi. It will reveal conditions the huge aqueduct tunnel will encounter in the vicinity of the Garlock Fault, which branches off the San Andreas. On the strength of what the pilot tunnel discloses, the method of construction will be selected for extending and enlarging it into the aqueduct tunnel. These and similar measures will render the Tehachapi tunnels as invulnerable as possible to earthquake damage. Water will emerge from the first eight miles of tunnel into Cottonwood Canyon, where it will split into two branches. The east branch will drop through a powerhouse on the first stage of a 140-mile journey. On its way along the south rim of the Antelope Valley, it will be lifted 54 stories at a pumping plant near the town of Pear Blossom. This high line will serve water agencies in both Antelope Valley and Mojave Desert before it reaches Cedar Springs Reservoir. Then, it's into a tunnel piercing the San Bernardino Mountains, through power plants, and on to Paris Reservoir. Back on the south slope of the Tehachapis, water for the West Branch is lifted again and continues south, passing through another hydroelectric plant to what will be mid-reservoir. The aqueduct will continue through more tunnels and another hydroelectric plant to empty into Castaic Reservoir. Like many aqueduct facilities, including Paris Reservoir, it will be open for recreation. It's at these two reservoirs, Paris and Castaic, as well as at delivery points along the East Branch, 
that the Metropolitan Water District takes over the tremendous job of handling the water. In the district's headquarters, teams of engineers are developing complex and interlocking plans for a new distribution network for this northern water. It will include more than 300 miles of giant tunnels and pipelines, water treatment plants and related works. Cost more than a billion dollars. The design of the new system is based on needs which have been projected over the next quarter century, and in some cases, to the year 2020. Long before then, as an added safeguard, the district may have at least one seawater conversion plant large enough to meet the requirements of a city the size of San Francisco. Distribution of water from the California aqueduct is the issue at hand now, however. The aqueduct's completion is scheduled for the early 1970s. The district's new distribution system must be ready. The major element will be the foothill feeder, a series of giant tunnels and pipelines nearly 100 miles long. Originating at Castaic Reservoir, it will at one point parallel and be even bigger than this railroad tunnel near Newhall. Its first destination, the Balboa Treatment Plant, a water purifying installation to be built just to the right of these two Los Angeles reservoirs in the northeast San Fernando Valley. About one third of the water will be rooted into the Balboa plant. The rest will continue east in the foothill feeder. Backbone of the distribution system, it will run under Little and Big Tahunga canyons, slant through the north slope of the Verdugo Hills, then along the south face of the San Gabriel Mountains to the Arroyo Seco, through 12 miles of tunnel to Santa Anita Canyon then on to San Gabriel Canyon, where a branch will lead into the district's Morris Reservoir. The main line of the feeder continues east to the district's existing treatment plant at Laverne, with another branch heading south to a second such plant near Yorba Linda in Orange County. The main foothill feeder continues on to Devil Canyon in the San Bernardino Mountains, where it will connect with the east branch of the California Aqueduct. Besides the foothill feeder, the district must build many other huge new lines to bring the water to areas in Orange County and Los Angeles County, and in Ventura County, also in San Bernardino and Riverside counties, and south to connect with San Diego County Water Authority facilities. The completed system will be integrated with the present one bringing Colorado River water to the coastal plain. The result will be a highly flexible and secure distribution system, since most areas can be served by the East Branch, West Branch, Foothill Feeder, or Colorado River Aqueduct, in various combinations and from different directions. Along the Foothill Feeder, water will be released into washes. Sinking deep into the earth, it fills spaces between rocks and grains of sand. This raises the level of vast underground reservoirs and brings dry wells back to life. An extensive underground replenishment program is already in progress using water from the Colorado River aqueduct. As Northern California grows, the amount of surplus water pouring into the Pacific through the Golden Gate will diminish. Before 1990, additional sources will have to be developed to keep the California aqueduct full like the Eel River on California's thinly populated north coast, seen here during Christmas week, 1964. Railroad bridges, normally 80 feet above the river, were submerged under 20 feet of swirling flood water, jammed with logs and debris, or torn away. In a matter of hours, enough water swept into the sea to supply Southern California for more than a year Studies are being made to control the eel and divert some of its surplus to the delta, where it can be pumped into the California aqueduct. But to meet California's needs and those of the entire Pacific Southwest region, a quarter of a century from now, increasing attention is also being given to the vast amounts of water that waste into the sea from the Columbia River. Water is life to Southern California. 
The Colorado River Aqueduct supplies it today. The California Aqueduct will supply it tomorrow. The Columbia and the sea may supply it day after tomorrow. But whether this water comes from ocean or aqueduct, the Metropolitan Water District will meet the needs of its people. And in fact, its achievements belong to the people of Southern California. Their faith has brought and will bring to this near desert pure, fresh water in abundance. Their faith has assured health, growth, and prosperity today and for untold tomorrow.